Hello everybody and welcome to this video which is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. So today ladies and gentlemen we're going to be editing the Victuallers Yard. Now you might recall a little bit ago we had the Grand Tabletop giveaway and I'm editing this not so much to announce a specific date as for the fact you might have noticed we're inching ever closer to 500,000 subscribers so I thought we'll do another giveaway dash sale because there's some rather large items which I'm also willing to part company with as well as smaller ones that I'm happy to give away. So since we're at about 490, just over 490,000 subscribers and growing about 6,000 subscribers a month, I anticipate it's going to be about late May. But as you can see, repurposing this little announcement segment on the Victor's Yard is pretty easy. It's all just text segments that have been pre-inserted. So I can just highlight, edit and change. And this is all in a separate section apart from the listed items for sale, which is one section above. And so nothing that I do here affects the posters section, which is quite handy. So yeah, look back here, I would say around about mid-May and there might be a more firm date. I'll also obviously be announcing it close to the time, but just like that, we're ready to save, exit, all ready to go, wonderfully easy thanks to Squarespace. So if after all these little mini tutorials I've been doing, you think you could build a website for maybe ideally naval history purposes, but you never know, you might want to do it for some other reason, then head over to squarespace.com forward slash Drakinafel. You can get a free trial, and once you're ready, that little link will give you 10% off your first website or domain. So thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring the video, and on with the main show. Now, a few weeks ago, I published a rather extensive video on the history of USS Monitor in conjunction with the Mariner's Museum. And a lot of you seem to like that video, which is very nice. However... I did notice a few comments in there which talked about Monitor ostensibly being able to have penetrated Virginia's armour if it was using quote-unquote full charges. Now, that is something of a misnomer, but I thought the best way to address it would be to do it in this format on a Friday video using an article I wrote for a magazine a few years ago entitled John Dahlgren and the Half-Charge Myth, the slightly more militant unknown prequel to the Harry Potter series, I suppose. Now, nonetheless, we're going to have a look in more detail at exactly where this came from and, you know, how the whole situation developed. So, as the smoke cleared around the Battle of Hampton Roads, which was, of course, the first clash of ironclad warships, Neither USS Monitor nor CSS Virginia were particularly damaged. To be sure, each ship sported dents, scrapes, and a handful of casualties, as well as significantly depleted ammunition stores, and in Monitor's case, a turret that had decided to moonlight as a merry-go-round. But both vessels could, and did, live to fight another day. For both sides, therefore, there was both rejoicing and recrimination. On the one hand, the ship's armour had held up, whilst on the other, the enemy's armour had also held up, under the pounding fire. As time passed, various ideas, solutions and explanations were advanced, but after the passage of over a century and a half, a commonly held belief is that Monitor's 11-inch guns were capable of smashing through the armour of her Confederate opponent, but had been prevented from doing so by only firing half-charges. Whether this was due to a Navy order or hesitancy on the part of her crew with an experimental ship depends on which particular version you read. If only, the myth goes, the guns had been allowed to be used at full power, then surely the Union Monitor would have emerged with a decisive victory. As it turns out, the truth is a bit more complex, but to see why, we first need to wind the clock back 18 years from the time of that battle to a much earlier period. In February 1844, many of the great and good of the then-current US government were gathered aboard the new steam warship USS Princeton. In addition to the ship's battery of short-range carronades, it also carried a pair of large 12-inch muzzle-loading guns. One was named the Oregon Gun and had been constructed using newly developed techniques from thousands of miles away in Liverpool, England, and these had been implemented by John Erickson, who would later go on to design Monitor. The other, named Peacemaker, was of an approximately similar size, but had been built more locally in New York using older gun forging methods. Three times on the voyage down the Potomac, the Peacemaker was fired 
to much appreciation. And then, as the ship headed back up the river, a final demonstration firing was called for. The lanyard was pulled, but instead of the now familiar muzzle flare, the gun failed catastrophically, almost instantly turning into a 12-ton pipe bomb. Six men, including the Secretary of the State and the Secretary of the Navy, were killed immediately, and more than a dozen were injured. President Tyler avoided becoming a casualty only because he was below decks at the time. Five years later, in 1879, another gun under testing exploded, this time killing the gunner. Present at this latter incident was 40-year-old Lieutenant John Dahlgren. This, and a variety of other slightly less fatal incidents, led to two primary developments. Firstly, the US Navy decided that the standard service charge, the amount of powder that would be used to propel a shell or shot in battle, should be set at a safe level by carefully testing the new guns being considered for service by incrementally increasing the amount of powder you put through them, as opposed to simply working out by calculation how much explosive you could stuff down the barrel and then firing to see if you were correct. The two incidents previously described, as well as the others, seemed to strongly counsel against following that latter method in the future. Secondly, Dahlgren determined that not only would he develop a gun that was suitable for firing both solid shot and explosive shells, as many guns at this time could do one or the other, but really both with any degree of success, but also he decided that his guns would not be so much of a hazard to their operators as they were to the enemy. As a result, Dahlgren's guns would weigh somewhat more than the average contemporary weapon of similar calibre, and would also fire their projectiles at a somewhat slower velocity if you compared them to some other guns of the period, like the rather high-velocity British 68-pounder smoothbore. But Dahlgren was true to his goal. His guns worked, and they didn't explode. In part, this was due to their new soda bottle shape, which, as you can see here, had an extremely thick construction around the firing chamber. This helped them to resist the immense pressures generated by firing the gun. But he also backed off a little bit from the leading edge of muzzle velocity, which meant that the stresses imposed on the gun as a whole were just simply less than might be experienced in other weapons. Partially to compensate for this reduction in overall kinetic energy of shot and shell, and partially because his techniques allowed for it, Dahlgren's guns would grow very rapidly in size as his work progressed. By the late 1850s, 10-inch and 11-inch guns were being made, and by 1862, a 15-inch version was also under construction. Whereas in the rest of the world, the typical large naval gun in use varied from about 6 inches to just over 8 inches in calibre in the vast majority of cases. Although, as mentioned, some guns had somewhat higher muzzle velocities, this didn't overly trouble Dahlgren because he believed that larger, if somewhat slower, projectiles would do more smashing damage to the sides of enemy ships, keeping in mind that during the development period for these weapons, the world's fleets were made of wooden vessels. Uh, since the Ironclad Age was not quite here yet. And so we come to the Battle of Hampton Roads. Neither Ironclad, as it turned out, was especially well equipped to deal with the other. CSS Virginia had a variety of guns, but most of its ammunition was thin-walled explosive shells. These were perfect for dealing with the flammable and fragile wooden warships that it was designed to fight, but they were near useless against any kind of armoured opponent, against whom the shells either tended to smash open, which resulted in a low-order detonation or flare-off of the contents that was more pyrotechnic display than actual threat, or else the shell might explode properly against the iron plates, but that would still see the vast majority of its energy either expended into open air or just reflected back into the atmosphere by the solid armour. What solid shot was available, had managed to put some dents in the Union ironclad, but not a lot else. Conversely, Monitor packed a pair of 11-inch Dahlgrens, but these were its sole armament. They were, of course, larger than any gun on the Virginia, 
which, thanks to the Confederate looting of the Norfolk Navy Yard, all those Gosport Navy Yard at the time, was also carrying Dahlgren guns amongst its other weapons, albeit these being smaller 9-inch versions. But a relatively slow projectile with a large surface area is almost the exact opposite of what you need to punch through armour, unless you use absolutely overwhelming power. And hence Virginia remained unpenetrated as well. The Monitor's guns that day were using a 15-pound service charge, i.e. each 166-pound projectile was sent down range by the ignition of 15 pounds of gunpowder. The reason for this was simply that the Navy instruction said that that's what they should use. The 11-inch was a relatively new weapon to the Navy, scarcely half a decade of service under its belt, and Dahlgren had been exacting in testing his guns hundreds of times to make sure that each combination of charge and shot, or shell, was safe. He had recommended that 15 pounds of powder would suffice, and thus the US Navy entered 15 pounds as the weight of powder to be used in the operation of its guns. And so, at the Battle of Hampton Roads, the gun crews of USS Monitor were using what their training and their manuals told them was the reasonable, safe and permitted charge. To use anything greater was to invite a repeat of the Princeton incident, only now, inside an armoured turret, which would magnify the effect of any explosion and likely kill them all, shortly before shrapnel bouncing off the interior walls of the turret finished off anyone who'd been lucky enough to survive. So, if the US Navy regulations are so clear, where does the half-charge myth come from? Well, simply put, when the results of the battle came in, Dahlgren was as disappointed as anyone else. In early 1862, the 11 inch was the most powerful weapon the US Navy possessed in active service. As we said, the 15 inch was under construction, but wasn't ready yet. If the Confederate Navy had already developed a way to prevent the 11 inch from scoring any meaningful damage, then the entire Union fleet would, in theory, be helpless to stop ships like the Virginia from doing exactly what they wished. Instead, it would be only the seaworthiness and range of the ironclads, and perhaps the outside chance of simply mobbing such a ship with boarding parties at utterly horrific cost, which would limit their operations. Thus, as well as continuing work on the 15-inch gun, Dahlgren applied himself to carefully testing his existing weapons still further. There were a few ways to improve the performance of them, he could use a powder that gave off more energy per pound that was burned. This was possible as new forms of gunpowder were being developed at that time, but it would have been something of a trial and error approach at first, because these were still somewhat experimental in the US. It was also possible to use a different form of shot, perhaps one made of steel, but the technology to mass-produce reliable quality steel shot was a few years off in the US as of 1862. The simplest approach was simply to increase the service charge, run some experiments, and see if the gun exploded. If, after a few hundred shots, the gun was still intact and didn't show any worrying amounts of wear, then you could try an even larger service charge, and so on and so on, until a larger service charge could be issued with a safe increase to the power of the gun. These experiments would be done fairly rapidly, which is somewhat understandable considering the Civil War was in full swing, and soon revised orders were issued stating that 20-pound surface charges were now safe for the 11-inch gun. Dahlgren diligently repeated his test cycles, and over the course of the war, the service charge weight increased in a series of steps, such that by the end of the war, a 25-pound service charge was in regular use, and there was a 30 pound charge also authorized. However, the instructions noted that 30 pounds was only to be used if the gun was not considered to be worn or otherwise at risk. A few enterprising captains would record that they fired their guns with even larger charges, but it's somewhat doubtful if this brought them any substantial increase in performance, as the relatively short barrel of the guns meant that past a certain point, if the gun actually held, much of the excess powder would just be blasted out of the muzzle unburnt, which admittedly would be a somewhat spectacular pyrotechnic display as some of it would eventually ignite. Later Union monitors, as of course USS Monitor herself had been lost in poor weather not too long after her debut battle, 
would wreak considerably more havoc on their Confederate opponents using the new heavier service charges alongside larger 15-inch Dahlgrens, but unfortunately the fact that later testing had revealed a charge double to what had originally been thought was safe was in fact viable to use has led some to correctly conclude that the 11-inch gun was always capable of these charges, and that, incorrectly, the US Navy or Dahlgren knew about this before the Battle of Hampton Roads, but restricted Monitor to the mere 15-pound charge on or before her famous encounter for nebulous reasons. In fact, Dahlgren's guidance at the time was spot on for current Navy practice and reflected the results of the test that had been conducted up to that date. The fact that he had unwittingly designed such a strong weapon that it could in fact withstand considerably more pressure was not known at the time of the Battle of Hampton Roads, and this would only emerge gradually over the following months and years. To draw an analogy from another war, about 80 years later, in World War II, some British battleships equipped with the 15-inch 42 caliber gun were issued with so-called supercharges to increase the range and penetration of their shells. For almost three decades prior, the guns had been used with a smaller charge with perfectly adequate results, but in the face of advances in enemy firepower and protection and unable to otherwise modify the guns and their turrets in wartime, as was done to some ships in the late 1930s, Increasing the size of the charge was determined to be the best way to keep the ships competitive, although it was also known that this would stress the guns more. Like Dahlgren, the charges were only issued because of a specific need and after extensive testing to ensure that they wouldn't cause the guns themselves to fail. Now, with the gulf in time and ship capability between World War I and World War II, it's relatively easy to see why someone making the assertion that a ship like HMS Malaya was firing underpowered charges at Jutland and was only brought up to her true potential in the 1940s are just embarrassingly wrong, but the story of the 11-inch Dahlgren in the American Civil War is essentially the same thing. It's just compressed into a matter of months, maybe a couple of years at best, instead of a few decades, hence the confusion. <laughs> 